morning, everybody. My name is Pradeep Behera. I'm a professor and chair of civil engineering department. Um, at the at the, for the civil engineering curriculum, we have two courses. Civil senior project one in the fall semester, senior project two in the spring semester. Let me record it first. This meeting is being recorded. Yes, uh, so our students, they start their senior project in the fall semester. And for this batch, it is fall 2020. And during this semester, they basically use all the knowledge, skills, uh, and attitudes that have they have uh, learned uh, since uh, their beginning of the curriculum, that is your freshman years so that they can design, that they can plan, design a real world projects uh, starting from scratch. And, and we are proud of our students, the way they, uh, they apply their skill set for this uh, real world projects, which you will witness soon. And uh, we have two groups and uh, the groups will uh, introduce their projects and introduce themselves um, as a part of the presentations. So, so we will start with the first group, which is uh, Kevin's group. And um, Kevin, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, you can upload your presentations and you can introduce your team and you can start your presentation. Okay, thank you for the introduction, uh, Dr. Pierre. Uh, so hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. We're going to be presenting the planning and design of civil engineer system for Lux Horizon. So this is a list of my group members and our advisor who, who helped us complete this project. And this is the presentation outline of a project. We're gonna be being, talking about projects that we did in the fall, then talk about our engineering system design for our proposed development. So last semester, we started our senior year by researching engineering projects. And the goal was to understand the planning, design, construction, operation, and maintenance of an engineer system. We also looked into how engineers solve, resolve problems they encounter. At the end, we presented our findings to our classmates. More specifically, we looked, in, we looked through the American Society of Civil Engineer magazine that publishes innovative design each month. And one project that we found was the New York City East Side West Side project that turned Asian piers along the Hudson River into eco parks. Last semester, we also worked on a small site development project. We had to demolish an existing single-family home and built that was built over a century ago and doubled the square footage. So our objective for this project was basically to get all the necessary permits to construct a new home. We also had to create a sediment control plant and design effective stormwater management system to minimize the runoff from the new home. Again, the main purpose of this project was to learn about the regulatory compliance and the permit process. Uh, we complied with the Montgomery County permit for demolition, uh, sediment control, and all the necessary permits to construct a new single family home. So for our sediment control design, we followed the Maryland Department of Environment Erosion Control Manual to develop a strategy for our, our site. And we found that a total of 10,000 square feet of land disturbance was required. To obtain the permits to construct a new home, we had to implement a stormwater management control to control the excess runoff from the site. We used the NRCS method to find the pre and post development and we use this to find the amount of water that will need to be stored. We then use this to implement low impact development practices to control the excess runoff. So the four that we picked for our project was basically an infiltration trend, rain guarding and low elevation of the site, a dry well to capture runoff from the gutters and permeable payments for the driveway. Uh, now I'll be talking about the large site development layout design. So the objective of this project was, was to design and to develop a 27 acres of land in Prince George's County into a mixed use subdivision. The client wanted townhomes, single family homes, office building. We also had to submit the water resources, the structural transportation system design for the development. So the constraint of the project was, was that there was an existing road to the north and east side of the development. There was a wetland located to the south of the development, which had the lowest elevation. Another constraint we had to follow was that we had to accommodate residential areas, uh, commercial areas in our proposed development layout design because that's what the client wanted. So in total, we came up with four layout design. The first step of our layout design process was basically to identify the PG County codes by going to the website. 
Uh, we then develop our own individual layouts and then evaluate each layout of the team and pick what we like. And this ultimately allowed us to complete our final layout. So this is our final layout design. It's subdivided to four origins. To the top left, our development is our commercial area with offices, retail, and parking garage. To the bottom left is our residential townhomes, and there's a park in the middle for residents and visitors to come by and enjoy. To the top of our development are single-family homes with two apartment buildings, and at the bottom right are more townhomes with two retail locations. So now we pass it on to my colleague, Nuriel, who will be talking about the project management aspect of our project. Thank you, Kevin. Hello, everyone. My name is Nira Ramirez, and I'm going to talk about project management. So the name of the project is Lots Horizon Site Development, and the timeline is from January 13 of this year until today, which is April 23rd. One, For the design four, engineer team, we have project management uh, Kevin Tercios and the four, following engineers. Every, each, each engineer was in charge of a section of the project. We have Carla, Danilo, myself, Usman, Esther, and Kalkiban. Next. For clients, we have Behera, uh, Dr. Behera, Dr. Brian Hicks, Dr. Ahmed Suntinsi, and Dr. Lane Wang. And for planning and scheduling, we defined an engineering team and we divided the work into seven sections. For assigned tasks weekly, at the start of the project, we had meetings twice a week, but after splitting the work, we only met once a week and all the information acquired in each meeting was um, was filed on our meeting minutes agenda. For layout project timeline, we ask, uh, we set out expected timelines for each task to be finished and while highly monitoring and controlling the project's execution. So monitoring and controlling and executing was the longest uh, part of the project that we spend the most time with. Next. <laughs> so this is our guide chart. As you can see, we have five different um, sections and chapters and without including the storm sewer system, which that was a one chapter on its own. And next. And this is the project timeline. Uh, every single one was kind of independent on their own, except for storm sewer system which needed storm water for completion. And that's all for me. That's all for this section. And thank you so much for listening. I'm gonna pass it on to Esther. Thank you, Noria. Good morning. My name is Esther Disam and I'm going to present on transportation engineering. Next, please. Uh, for our design objectives, we have to uh, design the streets and highways that are safe and efficient for our mm -hmm. residents in our development and we also had to create an, a road network that will meet the accessibility and the needs of our residents next please for the scope of this uh, for transportation engineering we had to identify the different zone in our land and we also had to calculate the parking spaces required for our development and designing also the cross section for our roads Next, please. For the zone distribution and our, de our development had um, have 10 zones. On the left side, we can see the table following the ETE code. And on the right side, we can see uh, how we uh, divided in AutoCAD and how you can see the different zones in our development. Next, please. For the tree generation, the tree generation is the amount of traffic that our zone, that our development will have after it's built. And to find it, we follow the ETE trip generation manual, the 10th generation, 10th edition. And the ETE, the, the trip was calculated by multiplying the trip rates by the dwelling units for residential and square feet for commercial areas and the total daily rate was um, found to be 1961 trips next please for the route assignment we have six nodes uh, in our development and in order to find the level of service on each road we use the volume over capacity ratio 
and the capacity was estimated to be nine, 1900. Next, please. For the parking generation, we follow the ETE parking generation manual, the fifth edition. And to find it, we use the formula multiplying the average parking supply by the built up area. Uh, for residential, it was multiplied by the dwelling units. And for commercial, it was multiplied. We lost connection, it looks like. Yeah, I think we lost uh, Esther. <laughs> Maybe next one, so that until yes. she joins. Yeah, okay. uh, I don't know what happened. Maybe no. the connection. Okay, continue, Sorry. continue. Yeah, we can. Yeah, continue. and our parking uh, spaces was up to nine, 975. Next, please. And for the road design, uh, we started the signal run three on at each intersection of our development. Two of our intersections were signaled, and our roundabout has a yield control sign, and other intersection has a stop control sign. And for the network design, we calculated the vertical curves and the stop sign distance following the Maryland Department of Department of Transportation. Next, please. For the cross section on the left side, we can see the roundabout, except that our roundabout is a T leg. And on the right side, we can see the cross section for our road, and each lane uh, is 10 feet, and the medium is 16 feet. Uh, um, it's done for me. I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Noya, who is going to talk about stormwater management. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Um, so now I'm going to talk about stormwater management. Uh, next, please. So for design objectives, for stormwater management design, we're going to retain and minimize the excessive amount of runoff created from the fully developed land. We're going to prevent flooding, especially in impervious areas of the development by using stormwater management techniques. We're going to design and implement environmentally friendly BMPs, which means best management practices into lots horizon development. And for scope of work, we're going to conduct hydrologic analysis for pre and post development conditions. We're going to follow the Maryland stormwater design manual. And after that, we're going to gather our stormwater requirements. And finally, we're going to analyze our BMPs and our design and choose the best uh, option. Next. So this is the pre and post development conditions for land. As you can see on the left, we have um, only green area and different elevations all throughout. And for post development conditions, we have all the impervious areas, which is houses and buildings, and just a small amount of green area. So the water is going to infiltrate from the top of the park to the lower left. Next, please. For hydrologic analysis, we, did, we have TR55 worksheet, NRCS method, and the rationale method. For the TR55 worksheet, we mainly use it for the CN number, and previously we tried to use it for the time of concentration. However, our numbers got a little bit off, so we did mostly everything manual by using the NRCS method and rationale method. So as Behara requested, we had a 10-year stormwater. So we use the 10-year stormwater to gather a runoff. So we subtracted the development minus the pre-development and we got the 2.10 inches. Next. So for stormwater alternatives, we use bioretention, poking sound filter, and wetland. So for bioretention, this is the process in which contaminants and sedimentation are removed from stormwater runoff. The stormwater is collected to the treatment area, which mainly consists of buffer grass, uh, sand, ponds, and mm, soil, and plants. So the bioretention is not really a workable solution since its main objective is to gather all the water to landscape, depressions of grass buffers and vegetation, and lots of horizon high, high impervious areas will make this alternative a little bit hard to comply since we will have to cut down on the number of houses 
and parking lot space. So for pocket sand filter, it's a filtering device that is designed to filter rainwater through sand and gravel. It's actually not very good looking or feasible to look at. And it's really, uh, this alternative is a costly alternative due to the requirements for a 27 acre land. We will need a lot of pocket sand filters all throughout the land. Next. So it's for stormwater wetland, it's a structural practice that is similar to weapons and a wetland system designed to maximize the removal of pollutants to a stormwater runoff. Um, so on the right, we have the stormwater requirements that we gather from following the Maryland Stormwater Design Annual, and this is needed for us to design our pond. Next. For wetland, we have on the left the water storage data and the discharge data tables. So for the water storage data table, it's mainly to calculate the amount of water we're gonna have, we're gonna need for the pond or the pond is gonna hold. And we did it, we did the volume per elevation. So we have it from 373 to 395. And on the right at 383, we're gonna start calculating the storage water, the storage, the storage above the water quality volume. For the discharge data, it's just gonna calculate the amount of the amount of water is gonna be in the outflow. So we're gonna calculate the total discharge per elevation, and then we're gonna follow or dam the requirements. So which is 3.5 inches orifice, the six foot wear, and the 12.2 wear. Next. So finally, I have the stormwater management pond design. On the left, we have the dam um, requirements and dimensions. And on the right, we have the, <clears throat> the pond design the Lux Horizon has. And that's all for me. Thank you so much for listening. I'm gonna pass it on to Kalki then. Thank you, Nuria. Hello, everyone. I'm Kalki Danayel, and I will be present the Storm Sewer System Design. Storm Sewer System is a public owned storm drainage system designed to convey storm water, and it is an important to good storm water management. Next slide, please. Here is the manual layout. We have 18 manhole in the layout here, and uh, the drainage is come to the low, uh, the wetland to the lowest levels. Next slide, please. Here is the design objectives. In the design objective to control and manage increased runoff from the post-development in paradise area, to safely convey storm runoff from the subdivision to storm water control system. And the design objective, we, we estimate pipe sizes, estimation of pipe slopes, and the velocity requirements. Next slide, please. In the scope of work, we survey area, which is a topographic survey at the, at the drainage issue location. We uh, storm sewer analysis, determining of the existing system capacity in the drainage report, which is access, which alternative are the most economical. Uh, next slide, please. Here is the catchment characteristics. In the catchment characteristics, uh, we uh, calculated a slope. It de depending on the manual elevation and the distance between, which is the spacing between the manholes. Next slide, please. Uh, in the, this is the design procedure. We should go through uh, eight steps, which is uh, inlet time, uh, the flow time calculation, time of concentration, runoff intensity, the catchment area, peak runoff flow, and pipe sizes. Finally, we perform the velocity check. Next slide. Here is one uh, sample calculations in the design calculation. So uh, at the sample calculation as a manual tool, there's two contributing area, which is named as area A and area B. So for area A, we go through all the eight steps, which is inlet calculation, flood times, time of concentration, uh, and calculation of rain intensity. Finally, we get here as a peak run of flow rate. And next, uh, next slide, please. So here is area B, which is contributing to the same thing to the manual B, which we go through uh, all the steps and get here as a peak runoff flow. Uh, next slide. So after getting all uh, the flow, so we size the pipes 
depending on uh, which is based on the mining question so uh, we find the the pipe's diameter and finally we should check the velocity whether the, it is required which is whether it meets our design uh, velocity requirement if it is the, if it doesn't meet the requirement we should go back and check uh, we should adjust the velocity the slope excellent is a cost estimation, which is uh, excavation cost, the reinforced concrete pipe, the manual and rubber gasket, and approximately uh, uh, around $2.3 million. Uh, 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 next, I will be passed to my colleagues, Danilo, and he will be proposing the sanitary sewer system design. Thank you. Thank you, Kokida. My name is Danilo Nascimento, and I'm going to be talking about sanitary sewer system design. Um, sanitary sewer system is a, a system of pipe. We can't hear you, Danilo. Danilo, increase the volume, please. Um, um, if you can. If I can. Can you, can you guys hear me? Get closer to the, to the mic, maybe. Yeah, I'm trying. Try uh, again. Can you, can you hear me? Can you hear me better now? Yeah, it's better. All right. So, like I was saying, sanitary sewer system is a system of pipelines responsible for taking wastewater from our homes and businesses to the trunk sewer. Uh, next slide, please. So, our main objectives of this, uh, this uh, design is to transport the sewage and the wastewater from our homes and businesses to the nearest trunk sewer uh, manhole, uh, while satisfying the Prince George's County regulatory requirements and follow Maryland design procedures in order to protect water quality and public health. Uh, next slide, please. So in the scope of our work uh, for this design, we have the design manhole layout, the flow estimation, the design of the pipe diameters, the pipe slopes, and the velocity check. Next slide, please. Uh, and we started with the manhole layout on design procedure. Uh, then we followed uh, with the flow estimation. Then we did the design, uh, the diameter design, and we finished off with the slope calculation. Next slide, please. As you guys uh, can see, this is our uh, manhole layout for the sanitary source system. We made sure that the wastewater went from the south of the, uh, of the layout and to, all the way to the north of the layout where we can find the trunk sewer. Next slide, please. When doing the flow st estimation, we uh, estimated four people per household, and we used a coefficient of 1.2 uh, to calculate future population. And for, um, cal uh, for the present and future flows for non-residential areas, we used a coefficient, and we multiplied that coefficient by the area of the attributed to that pipe. Uh, for residential areas, we use the coefficient and multiply that coefficient by the number of dwellings attributed to that pipe. And we use the peak factor of four when calculating our peak flow. Next slide, please. When doing the diameter design, we use the peak flow calculated previously. Uh, we used to propose proposed slopes, uh, slopes um, and then number of 0 0.013. Uh, the flow of the lateral pi pipes was designed to be halfway through the pipe. Uh, the sub-main pipes uh, flow was designed to be two-thirds through the pipe. Next slide, please. Uh, for the slope calculations, we used the uh, Manning's uh, equation, an end value of 0 0.013, uh, velocity, hydraulic radius, and we made sure that the velocity in the pipes was between 2 and 8 feet per second in order to avoid uh, solids getting stuck in the pipes. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and when calculating the overall cost of the whole system, we had into account the cost of the pipes, uh, excavation, uh, manholes, and labor. And in total, we had a cost of $1.25 million. Now I'm going to pass to Carla, who's going to talk about water supply system. 
All right. Thank you, Danilo. Good morning, everybody. My name is Carla Flores, and I'll be speaking on the water supply system design. Basically, a water supply supply system can be defined as an infrastructure that's designed to collect, treat, and store uh, and distribute water to different type of land uses, such as residential homes, commercial establishments, and industrial establishments. Next slide. The design objectives of this section of the project mainly was to design a water supply network that's able to provide an adequate water supply to the Lux Horizon development. And you can ensure this by selecting appropriate pipe sizes, calculating appropriate pressure heads, and meeting the required fire demand of the system. Next slide. The design procedures of this section can be summarized into four major steps. The four one the first one being um, identifying the different land uses in the Lux Horizon development. Um, in our case, we have commercial, residential, and office, and then determining the average use for each of this land type. The water demands that I used were retrieved from the Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission Manual. The next step was to divide the subdivision into five sections in order to create loops, pipes, and nodes. Um, basically, I labeled every intersection in order by letter. The third step was to find required flow, fire demand, and pressure heads, and finally to do the to to do the Hardy Cross method. And after all the calculations were performed, I basically did a cost summary. Next slide. Here I have the pipe layout. Um, so I have my five loops. The first one is a commercial and office area. Loops two, three, and four were residential areas. And loop five was a mixture of residential and local commercial. I also have my inflow at node A and my outflow at node F. My pipe lengths and diameters are also displayed in the figure below. Next slide. When it came to the flow requirements, also known as the discharge at each node, the following equation was used. And basically all you had to do was multiply the water demand by the area and you would get a small value in cubic feet per second. Next slide. Two criteria that I had to compare was basically the demand flow rate and the maximum hourly usage. From these two criteria, I had to select a higher value, which was actually gonna be my inflow at my first node, which was node A. Next slide. When looking at pipe size um, and type, basically standard pipe sizes for a water supply system tend to be six, eight, or 12 inches. For my design, I chose to do eight and 12 inch pipes. Also, there's different materials of pipes, which can be ductile iron pipes and cast iron pipes. Basically, this pipe diameter gets plugged into the Hazen-Williams formula and you ultimately obtain a K value that is necessary for the iteration. Next slide. In this initial network diagram, I basically have a summary of the calculations I spoke of. So once again, the inflow and outflow, and I have my discharges displayed in red, and I have my assume um, flow in between pipes in yellow, which will be corrected during the hydraulic analysis. Next slide. So doing the Hardy Cross method, it took a total of 14 iterations in order to correct my flow values enough to an accurate point. I knew I reached a uh, accurate enough point when all of my head losses were below 0 0.001. Next slide. When looking at my minimum pressure and pressure heads, basically I had to list out all the possible paths in my network and I had to select the path with the highest head loss and add it to the minimum pressure of the system. In my case, the minimum pressure of my system was 30 PSI. So this added value is actually my first pressure head at my first node. So after adding and subtracting the remaining head losses, ultimately at the final node, you should have the minimum pressure once again of 30 PSI. Next slide. My final network diagram now displays my pressure heads at every node. I have my corrected flow values in between pipes and I have my discharges. Ultimately, everything added out pretty nicely. So that's how you know how you have a successful network design. Next slide. 
The final step was to do a cost summary. Basically, I used the standard prices for Rockville manual. This manual was for 2010, so of course I had to account for inflation. And basically, I came up with a cost of 1.3 million approximately, which is almost a $300,000 increase if this was designed a decade ago. Thank you for listening. And next we have Usman. Thank you, Carla. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Usman Chaudhary, and I will be presenting the structural designs. When designing, civil engineers use structural analysis to assess forces that could act on a structure and choose materials and reinforcements that will effectively withstand those forces. Next slide. We were tasked to design a five-story steel structure office building and design shallow and deep foundation and design a retaining wall. Next slide. The office building is designed following the guidelines from International Building Code and the Prince George County Building Code. The building components such as re reinforced uh, concrete slab and steel members and are designed uh, following the standards and ACI. Uh, it's had by ACI 318 manual and the steel construction manual. Next slide. Uh, here we have a few different structural uh, views of the building and showcasing the steel members uh, used on the building. Um, all drawings are completed using AutoCAD. Next slide. Okay. Uh, and designing, there's different types of loads uh, to consider. Dead loads, live loads, rain load, wind load, and snow load. Dead load is basically the weight of the structural members, such as steel beams, steel girders, steel columns, um, and the weight of the slab. Uh, for the live loads, we have to refer to International Building Code. Um, live load is de is determined as per usage of the building. Rain loads, wind loads, and snow loads were also determined. Next slide. Here we have a design uh, which depicts how the loads are transferred throughout the building. Starting with the slab, the load is transferred from the slab to the beam, from the beam, uh, it's transferred down to the girders, from girders, it moves down to columns and then down to the foundation. Next slide. Okay. When designing steel uh, beams and girders, uh, we started off by placing a grid over the layout of the building floor. We then numbered each steel member and, de and determined the tributary area. After calculating the factor load and slab width, we, we determined the maximum moment we would then uh, select a beam and redesign it to withstand loads greater than the maximum moment. For column design, we followed a similar procedure to determine the maximum load that will be applied on the column and also calculated the slenderness ratio and determined area required for the columns. We follow steel construction manual to determine which column to use. Next slide. For foundation, uh, for our office building, we designed two two types of foundation. We have shallow foundation and deep foundation. Uh, reinforced concrete foundation or footing uh, transmits load from a structure to supporting soil. In this project, score, uh, in, in, in this project, square spread footings are designed based on the nature of the load, properties of the footings, and properties of the soil. We use the boring log data to determine soil index properties. We use four different methods uh, to, to determine um, the drainage friction area for the boring log. Um, and after reviewing the results, we decided to move forward with the, uh, with the Osaki 1959 method. Next slide. And this led us to determine the footing sizes for the interior columns, exterior columns, and corner columns for uh, the footing sizes are in feet. Um, interior columns footing would be nine by nine feet. Uh, exterior columns seven by seven. Corner columns would be five by five feet at a depth of 2.5 feet to support the allowable load. Next slide. The deep foundation, uh, we decided to use precast concrete piles. Uh, we used the Miroff uh, method and the Bryan method to determine the allowable pile capacity which led us to determine the, the diameter of the pile and the depth it would need to be driven into. We decided that we would need two different uh, sizes of piles because the exterior and the corner piles, um, uh, because the, the exterior and the corner columns do not carry the same load as the interior um, column. Therefore, there's no need to over-engineer the capacity. For interior columns, we used a four feet by four feet pile driven at, the, at a depth of 60 feet 
for exterior columns and corner columns, uh, we we will use a two by two um, a pile driven at a depth of 40 feet. Next slide. The purpose of a retaining wall is to hold soil behind them. However, the specific needs can vary depending on the project. Uh, the wall will be located near the open space park in the development. We designed a tapered cantilever retaining wall. The, the equation listed here uh, was used to determine the load of the wall. Next slide. We conduct a shear analysis, overturning analysis, soil bearing pressure analysis on the wall. Uh, we decided the stem thickness to be 16 inches to resist factor shear load. The, the many figures are determined and listed here on the right. Next slide. Cost. The material cost of the steel members um, and concrete slab total up to 420350 um, I now pass this on to my colleague Danello to present sustainability. Thank you, Prisman. Uh, can everyone hear me well? All right, so I'm going to talk about sustainability now. Um, so sustainability main goal is, is to maximize the chances of using green or clean methods in every area of our project. Next slide, please. So for the sanitary sewer system, we decided to go with anaerobic digestion, uh, which gave us different uh, types of natural uh, fuel. Next slide, please. For the stormwater sewer system, we decided to go with biofil uh, biofiltration, bioretention swells, uh, pyramid and permeable uh, pavements that helps uh, help us uh, control uh, runoff a little bit better. Uh, next slide, please. For st structural design, we decided to go with solar panels and wind energy as our main sources of uh, energy for residential areas. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, for transportation, we decided to go with recycled asphalt and concrete or porous asphalt and concrete, as well as charging stations in order to incentivate people to go more on a electrical uh, vehicle side of things. Thank you. Next slide. Um, we have reached the end of our presentation, and we just like to thank the UDC CIS C Civil Engineering Department, uh, Dr. Vejera, Dr. Higgs, Dr. Z, Dr. Zan, Dr. Wang, Mr. P Mr. Sanchez. Uh, they really helped us grow uh, and get ready to be engineers. I don't know if somebody else wants to say anything to add. Yeah, I would like to thank uh, every one of our uh, professors who helped us get to this point and um, our, my, my colleagues as well. Uh, so that's all for our presentation, and we will take any questions if there's any. Yes, uh, thank you, Kevin and the group uh, for the presentations. Now we have question answer. So, yeah, this was, just for the group. This was, this was uh, probably one of the best uh, at UDC senior project presentation. You guys did a very good job. And overall, I commend you, each and every one of you. You did very well. One quick question regarding pipe layout, initial network diagram. What kind of software did you use? And oh, that was just that was um, AutoCAD that oh. I created. My those are CAD files in PDF format. Oh, you did such a good job. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, with different colors. And that was one of the best that we have ever seen here. Thank you. Great. I try to like uh, make them all look different. To differentiate yes, them. That's I, I noticed that. And your accuracy perfect. Great job. Okay. Uh, any questions? So uh, uh, thank question. you, Dr. G. Yes, please. Okay. And uh my question goes to the foundation design. When when you do the foundation design from the scratch, how did you get the soil parameters on the lab report? So, uh, so uh, does Kevin want to take this or should I? Yeah, I, I could take it. Okay. So basically, the, uh, 
uh, those soil parameters, um, you have to conduct a, a geotechnical survey on the land. And basically that's done by doing a, a boring, you look like doing boring log data. So basically uh, it's like a shaft, they drill a shaft to like the, the dirt to test, to test like the, the strength of each layer. So basically using that, you can calculate the, the drainage friction angle. And there's like multiple methods of doing it. So you can find like the most conservative one to like do your analysis for your foundation design. Okay. Um, I have a couple of questions. So what are the most challenging uh, tasks that you did in the last site development? Um, um, I can kind of speak on this one. Mm -hmm. So for me, the most challenging task was sort of um, doing, so I, I, I did stormwater and I also did water supply. Um, so when I was doing stormwater and I had to actually like, you know, follow a manual for Maryland and basically there was like a gap in knowledge that I had to like apply on my own. That was the most challenging thing, just figuring out how to do that based off what I already knew. Um, and basically just making sure, like understanding what I had to do was really challenging, um, more than so actually doing it. And in the end, I think I was able to understand how something would be done like in real life. So like in the state of Maryland as compared to, in comparison to how we were doing things like in class. So that was kind of challenging for me. Okay. Yeah, I would I would have to agree with that, especially because um, we're doing this from scratch. Uh, most of the times in the in class, we had that data given given to us, and now we're the ones who have to come up with it. Um, so that part of it was a little bit challenging for sure. So, if in your group, as in your teamwork, it's a teamwork team project. So, what was the fun part of the team team project? Um, I can go talk about it. So basically this project was different than all the other projects that we've done in class with our professors, because this was like a big project with like multiple sections. So at first it was really difficult, like trying to get organized, like like what the next step, but over time we like learned how to do it. And throughout our time, we got to meet each other better and like, uh, like knew our strengths and weaknesses. And we also like helped each other out. So I feel like that was, uh, really the best part about it because I got to be uh, I got to like work every single day with them and like talk to them and like get to know them better than than before mm -hmm. and and uh, given the pandemic situations you know you we all do things in the virtual so uh, what was the challenging in the virtual environment carrying out this project I can see. Oh, go ahead, Naria. <laughs> um, I feel like the most challenging part of this is like having the meetings at the same time with everybody, everybody having to follow, like, we all had to comply with each other's schedules overall, especially in the weekends, because people have things to do, so people work, and I think that's the most challenging part. As well as communication, of course, because if we are not in a person-to-person -person basis, we're going to be able to um do things faster i feel like um i agree with what nuria was saying basically like if it was in person and you have a question for someone you just walk up to them and you ask them you get your question right then and there but when it's virtual they could be doing something in their house like you have to wait till they get on their phone or get on their computer to text you back you can't just get your answer immediately so that was like the hardest part of like the virtual for me okay thank you so, any other questions? So I have uh, two comments really quick. One is um, audience, please complete the survey to um, let us know how our students did. And the second comment is I did not see much on connected and autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles in the presentation. So addressing that future technology. 
So, so how you, would thinking of the future change what you are proposing in your project? Yeah, uh, we we touched a little bit on uh, on it. Um, you're right, we didn't implement it a lot uh, on the sustainability side of the project, but we did talk about um, charging um, stations uh, to put throughout the the, the layout to uh, basically give an incentive to people to go to that route uh, of vehicle um, electric electric vehicles but yeah that that would be pretty much uh, most, most of it does anyone um i can talk a little bit about like the sustainability on that for like the transportation side so basically on um, like one of the one of the layout design that we came up with had it like um uh, a gas station and then we realized that we should not have that that because in the future everything would be electrical and like with electric vehicles so we started to limit that for our final design and also another thing that we decided to like for our road system we basically put bike lanes uh, because our development is not a really large area so we decided to put that and also um uh, our, we also did our parking garages so they have the possibility of like uh, implementing charging stations But it's something that we had, a, we didn't really like, um, we could have gone more in, in depth, like in detail, we'll say. Okay, good. Any other questions? Okay. Okay, if hearing none, then uh, congratulations team, Lux, Lux team. So- Lux Horizon. Lux Horizon subdivision and um, well, on behalf of civil engineering department, I wish you all the best. And um, we are looking forward to hearing the next group. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.